So standing between you and lunch is Nuria Nurgaliev, <laughs> who is uh, an excellent PhD student uh, in our group, so Renato had to leave. Uh, Nuria works um, in the more esoteric sides of quantum foundations and has been tasked with making this accessible and interesting to an audience of computer scientists, experimentalists, materials, people, and so on. So um, she'll talk about thought experiments in a quantum computer. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to indeed give a talk on um, thought experiments on a quantum computer. So this is joint work which was done together with Simon Mattis, who was a master student at the time, uh, Lydia and Renato. And here we basically developed a software for quantum computers where you can just run your thought experiments uh, which in, in quantum mechanical settings. So while I'm talking, there is, there is this QR code at which you can access the GitHub repository where the software is, and also some examples and documentation. This is still work in progress, and there is a paper in preparation, but for now, you can just check out GitHub. So in science, we turn to so-called thought experiments when we want to explore the theory in question and the limitation of this theory. So the prominent examples of this are um, Maxwell's demon in thermodynamics, or a twin paradox in special relativity. However, uh, these thought experiments, they have not only conceptual value. Um, so for example, in quantum mechanics, the conceptual value is that we, uh, we use them to formulate certain no-go theorems which rule out interpretations of quantum theory. Uh, and uh, the main characters of this, of this scenarios are um, reasoning agents or reasoning machines which are allowed to draw certain conclusions based on their knowledge. So why should we care about these settings? So suppose that you have this classical scenario, you have a network of computers, uh, and these computers have to, be, have to reason independently about an event which happens somewhere else in the network. And we want them to do it uh, consistently. So let me illustrate with a very sim silly example, uh, what I mean by reason consistently. So initially, I started this story with uh, three logicians walking to a bar. But we're not logicians, it is still work day, so let's just say there's a three quantum scientists which are always there when we somehow talk about quantum. So these are Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they're, as us, waiting for lunch. And then somebody comes in and asks them, does everybody want lunch? And Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they're highly logical and reasonable people, so they're going to answer very logically. Uh, and they're going to take turns answering this question. So first Alice says, I don't know. Then Bob says, I don't know. Then Charlie says, uh, yes. So how was Charlie able to... Uh, to make this conclusion that everybody in this group wants lunch. Well, he just, uh, he just started thinking about Alice. So Alice, if Alice didn't want lunch, she would have answered no to the question because she would know with certainty that not everyone in the group uh, would want lunch. But she answered, I don't know, because she didn't have enough information about Bob and Charlie and whether they wanted lunch. The same reasoning can be applied to Bob. And finally, uh, Charlie, knowing that Alice and Bob wanted lunch, and Charlie wanted it as well, answers yes, and they all happily get uh, their lunch, as we will too in 20 minutes or so. Uh, so this is what I mean by consistent reasoning uh, and consistently, consistently reasoning about others and yours' knowledge. Uh, we would also want uh, a network of quantum computers to be able to consistently reason about, um, the, uh, about their knowledge. However, this might prove to be difficult. Uh, so for example, in a quantum mechanical thought experiment, which was designed by Daniela Frauchiga and Renato Renner, uh, the, the agents, reasoning machines, which are modeled as quantum systems, um, can, uh, can come to a contradiction when, when they reason about each other's outcomes. Uh, this, uh, this conclusion was, of course, made on the basis of certain assumptions which concern how these agents were modeled, how they made their inferences and predictions, and also how these inferences and predictions were combined. 
And basically, what our software allows us to do is it allows us to um, to play around with these assumptions and see and different settings and protocols, including the uh, Flauchigarena setting, and see if uh, they uh, they result uh, uh, they result in contradiction or not. So, uh, in the following, I'm going to give a less silly and more measurement outcome related example of reasoning agents. Uh, then, it, then we'll see how we model measurements and model reasoning in, in our software. Then we see how, or how our software is structured. And finally, I will walk you through one of the testing examples, which is the frau higer thought experiment. So uh, we've seen the silly example of Alice, Bob, and Charlie uh, getting their lunch. So now Alice and Bob had their lunch, they're back to their labs and the usual day. And the usual day of Alice is that she takes the system R, which is prepared in the state that you see above, and she measures it in a computational basis. Uh, and then uh, she has to prepare system S, which she, th which she then sends to Bob. And she prepares the system S condition on her outcome. So if she gets outcome zero, then she prepares the system S in a state zero. And if she gets outcome one, she prepares it in a state plus. And sends it to Bob. And Bob measures it in a computational basis in his lab. So the point where Bob gets the system and gets the outcome of, of his measurement, it, it is so that Alice had evening plans and she already closed her lab and she's gone. But still, Bob wants to know what was Alice's outcome. So, and suppose that the case is that uh, Bob's outcome of the measurement of S was one. So now, the question we might ask is, the Bob asks himself, is that, okay, I got outcome one. What did Alice measure in her lab? And you can think a bit about it, but the answer is that in, th in this case, Bob can reason with certainty that Alice measured one. Why? Because the Bob starts thinking, okay, if Alice measured zero, then she must have prepared the system S in a state zero, according to the protocol, and then I, would, there would, um, I couldn't have measured one when I was measuring S, which means that um, A got outcome one. So this is a more um, experimental setting related, measurement outcome related, let's say, example of how agents reason. Now, what we want to do is, the next step is uh, to also model Alice and Bob as quantum systems. For this, the first, uh, the first element that we need to have is how we model measurements that are done in the lab. So, if we think about how we measure a particular observable in the lab, we can think about, for example, spin. So the famous way of, me of measuring the spin is sten experiment, where we measure the spin by coupling it to, um, to a magnetic field. And we do this by implementing the interaction Hamiltonian, which couples the spin uh, to one of the motional degrees of freedom of the particle. And uh, the whole measurement can be seen as unitary evolution uh, corresponding to this interaction Hamiltonian. Of course, a remark here, especially for experimentalists in the audience, this is a very idealized situation that we see. Of course, uh, in experimental setting, there is always dissipation into environment, but here we, uh, we don't consider these interactions with the environment, and uh, we model the whole measurement as a unitary. Now, uh, now a more quantum computing example, so to say, which also illustrates one of the famous thought experiments in quantum mechanics. So suppose that we have the following uh, scenario. Alice is back in her, in her lab. She again has the system R that she measures. And her lab is isolated. And on, on the outside of the lab, there is this re retired professor from another department who is really curious in what is happening in Alice's lab. Uh, but the lab is isolated, as I already said. And in this case, uh, this uh, Alice is 
modeled as a quantum system. Namely, we can model her as a memory qubit where the result of her measurement is written down. And uh, the, the process of the measurement, there are, uh, one can see two distinct views on the process of the measurement. Uh, one by Alice, where she, uh, she just measures the system R in computational basis and gets outcome 0 or 1. Or from Wigner's point of view, um, the whole evolution, the whole measurement process, evolution of the whole lab can be seen as a unitary process where the, which, uh, which is the coherent copying of the state into, the, into Alice's memory, which results in the following joint state of R and, uh, and A. So two things that we take away from this slide. First is that uh, if Alice's memory is, is modeled as a qubit, we can simply um, model the memory update, right, uh, the measurement, as a CNOT gate. And the second insight is that this shows that the operating with knowledge and statements that agents make in quantum mechanics might not be as straightforward as in, classical, in a classical setting. Because here we have the same physical um, scenario that ensues and the theory clearly allows both Alice uh, and Wigner have different descriptions of the, of the same scenario. Okay. Now, let us come back to our Alice and Bob. And uh, now what we want to do in this example, the next step is we want to see how we can model uh, Bob's reasoning. As, um, as a unitary process or as a quantum circuit. So in this case, he has to reason that in case, in case that he gets outcome one, Alice uh, gets outcome one as well. So we do it in the following way. So um, here we have the system S that Bob is uh, measuring. Then we have a qubit B where Bob notes his outcome. Uh, and then we have two instruction qubits. In this case, it's only two, uh, because Bob can only have two outcomes, so, um, and he only has to reason about Alice. So the first qubit corresponds to um, the inference that Bob can make if, um, if he gets outcome zero. And in this case, this qubit is not uh, initialized, because there is basically no certain statement that Bob can make about Alice's um, uh, Alice's measurement outcome if he gets outcome zero. But if, if he gets outcome one, he can with certainty state that Alice got outcome one as well. So this qubit is initialized in the state one. And then we have the prediction qubit, um, prediction system, where, um, where, we, where we store uh, Bob's prediction about Alice's outcome, uh, which is initially in a state which corresponds to the I don't know. Uh, and then uh, we have the following scheme. So first, Bob measures system S, which as we've seen, corresponds to a C naught. Then uh, he has to uh, carry out two updates. So the first update corresponds to the case where he gets outcome, which is conditioned on him getting outcome um, zero. Then we check the, the corresponding inference qubit, instruction qubit, and then we see if we need to update the prediction or not. Uh, and then the second, uh, the second condition, the, the second operation is conditioned on a case where he gets outcome outcome one. Then we also check if the um, if the corresponding inference qubit is initialized, and then we also update the prediction. So of course, in this setting, uh, the only up, the only update that will actually happen is the second one. Uh, so this is the simplest kind of example of uh, how we can model reasoning. Um, of course, we, we, don't, we don't claim that it, this is in any way optimal, so feel free to come up with your own uh, models, but um, this is just an example of how, how can one implement that. Okay, now uh, to the software package structure. So our software package has four, uh, four main Kind of input, uh, input elements. So the first element is the logical element where 
um, where we basically define the rules, how or which inferences agents are allowed to make, how and when these inferences can be combined, and so on. So then we have the agent module where we see where, where we define uh, the agent and which qubits um, the agent has, where or uh, which are the qubits. His, uh, which are his memory, and uh, where, where he stores inferences, and so on. Then we have the interpretation module, where, where basically um, we choose our version of quantum theory, or so to say, we choose, for example, uh, where, where we put the Heisenberg cut between the classical and quantum, or if there is any Heisenberg cut. And uh, finally, the protocol. This is basically the... Um, the steps, step by step description of the actions that agents have to make. For example, Alice makes measurement, um, Alice prepares system S in a state condition on that, sends it to Bob, and so on. And then finally, having all these four inputs, uh, we can reach, uh, as an output, we get a conclusion whether this uh, framework is consistent or not. So one of the testing examples, which is already um, input in the, in the software package as one of the protocols where you can test your um, interpretation or logical uh, axiomatic system, is the Frau Higuerena thought experiment, which I already mentioned in the beginning. So here, agents uh, come to contradiction uh, by reasoning about each other's outcomes. And so, you already know two characters of the story, which are Alice and Bob, and you already know what they do. So, uh, from the previous example, so Alice has the system R, um, and she she measures measures it in a computational basis and writes down the result to her memory. Then she prepares the system S based on the uh, outcome that she gets, and this is the intermediate state. Of the of of three systems, Alice, R, and S. Then she sends the system S to Bob, and Bob measures it in a computational basis and writes down the result to his memory. And this is the this is the state of um, Alice's and Bob's labs combined. Then there are two new characters who enter the story, which are Ursula and Vigna. And Ursula uh, measures Alice's lab, so Alice and System R jointly, in OK fail basis. And Vigna measures Bob's lab, and uh, also his OK fail basis. So we have the following protocol, and now we will see, uh, we look at which statements the agents can make. So first we start with Wigner, who just says, okay, I'm, uh, I'm choosing the round of the experiment where both Ursula and I get outcomes okay. Uh, this is possible because the probability of this event is non-zero. Then we come to Ursula, who, who can reason with certainty in the same way, and this can be shown in the same way as we've seen for Bob reasoning about Alice, that if she gets outcome okay, then Bob will get outcome one. Uh, with the Bob's piece of reasoning, we're already very familiar. And then finally, we come to Alice, who can say that, uh, oh, if I get outcome one, they can pr then I can predict that Wigner gets outcome fail. So we have the following four statements. And if we combine them in the order I just mentioned them, uh, we arrive to a contradiction. Uh, of course, as I said already, this, uh, this conclusion was made based on a number of assumptions. So we model the agents in a particular way. Uh, they model each other's evolution in a particular way. Um, we are allowed to combine the statements made by different agents, and so on. So again, uh, what you can do with uh, our software package is play around with all the settings. So you choose your favorite axiom system for logic, uh, so if you have any justified reason for why, for example, we cannot combine the statements, you put it in there. Uh, you choose your model for agent, maybe you optimize the reasoning circuit, maybe you choose to uh, reason differently. 
you can you can choose your preferred interpretation or come up with um, your own way of uh, saying where the cut is. And then you, you input any protocol that you want, uh, including FR, maybe some more complicated one that you would want to test. And then you reach um, a conclusion whether this was consistent or not. So, yeah. This, uh, this marks the end of my talk, so feel free to check out the software package. We'll update it with more interpretation in the following months. And yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nuri. We have some time for questions. For C. You have always modeled your agents by pure states. Um, I have a hard time with that. Can you give some good arguments why agents should not be in mixed states? Um, okay, that's a good question. So again, I'm, as I already mentioned, we also, for example, model measurement process as a unitary. So um, I guess like my answer to this would be uh, if there is, okay, there are two answers. So first, if, um, if, it's, if, if the agent is not in a pure state and in a mixed state, let us just take um, a bigger system, which would be in a pure state, and then do our um, operations with that. Uh, on the other hand, if, uh, if the correlations with the environment are sufficiently small, then, for example, what one can do is update their um, certainty definition. So, for example, uh, all these inferences in the network are, um, are made with certainty. So, which means the, the probability of this inference is one. But for example, if one can also make it um, as say, oh, the if the probability is one minus epsilon, where epsilon is sufficiently small, then um, this would also be okay. More questions? I think I didn't quite get the consequence uh, if your protocol leads to inconsistent results. So that means some of your um, assumptions were wrong, I assume, but then what does that tell you in the end? Um, so as I said, usually the thought experiments where, um, where agents come to some, some sort of inconsistency, they are used for no-go theorems, where exactly, w w which mean exactly that one of your assumptions is wrong or one of your assumptions does not work, basically. Um, and why is, it, why is this bad? Where, for example, I, I, made, I, made a, um, I made a point of saying that uh, reasoning in classical settings has to be consistent, so our knowledge is consistent with each other. And, uh, and we would want to have the same consistency for the uh, knowledge and information we get from quantum networks, for example. So uh, the, I guess the goal of this program would be to find the set of axioms which uh, would allow us to rule out the inconsistencies which appear in such networks. Yep. That's a follow-up to his question. In the example you gave where you found out the inconsistency, which part of the axiom, which axioms was uh, the problem? Huh. That's a very good question, yes. Okay, so um, in the original experiment, or this, in, the, in the original paper, there are uh, three, three assumptions that one makes. Uh, the first is that agents are allowed to use the Born rule to make their predictions. So and, uh, even the Born rule with probability one, so they always have to make the statements with certainty. Uh, the, second prediction, the second assumption is that uh, they are allowed to combine their statements um, in, the usual, in the usual logical way. So for example, uh, if, if Bob says, if I get outcome one, then Alice get out outcome one. And Alice says, if I get outcome one, then Vignan gets outcome fail, then these can be combined. And uh, the, th the third one is the assumption that uh, if an agent makes a measurement, they get a certain outcome. So if, uh, if I get uh, so, for example, if I measure the system uh, in a state plus, um, 
in a computational basis, I get either zero or one. There is no kind of third option for me. Uh, one additional assumption one can uh, point out is the assumption that agents modeled the evolution in other agents lab, uh, which are isolated as a unitary. Um, yeah, and then, of course, there is, there is a lot of debate on which assumption uh, needs to go, and there's no good theorem. So for discussion, you can see yeah, the original paper and also some follow-up papers um, by Renato and myself. Okay, so if there's no more questions, let's thank again Nuri and all the panelists. This morning. So you can now go for lunch. You can also carry some more poster stands there. Uh, there's some downstairs as well. Uh, and we restart at 1.30. If you did not register for lunch, but want to have lunch, then let everyone else sit down first and then ask the staff if, if there's still a place. Okay.